I guess what I want to start doing today is to sort of raise some, uh, an issue that I, I anticipate you'll, you might have trouble with. It's sort of, you know, there's all kinds of these little things like the difference between only if and if. We should just sort of get down and remember that only if usually single, signals something that's going to be in the consequent of a, a conditional, and if signals something that's going to be in the antecedent of a conditional. Uh, just as necessary conditions are going to be found in the consequent of a conditional and sufficient conditions are going to be found in the antecedent. If you spend some time to think this through, you know, just sort of try and figure out what exactly these sentences mean that have only if in them or necessary conditions or sufficient conditions, you should get an aha experience. You should get to the point where you say, oh yeah, okay, now I see it. If you, if you don't get that, keep pressing, keep asking questions, keep letting me know that you just haven't got it yet, uh, or talk to somebody else about it, get therapy, no, I'm, uh, whatever. I mean, but that's the key. It's not supposed to be just, you just remember this stuff and memorize it. It's supposed to really sort of, uh, you know, strike home and make intuitive, logical sense, finally. It might take a while, you know, I think, finally just sort of get past the words. Sometimes you start repeating these words again, they start becoming meaning, meaningless if, if you had that experience. I certainly have, um, sometimes while talking to you up here on the <laughs> platform. But uh, if you have the experience where you just keep repeating this stuff over and over again and then finally it just, it's going bluey, just go do something else. You know, get your head off of that and, uh, and come back to it later. But the key I'm trying to suggest is intuitiveness. That will be the sign that you've got something when you say, oh yeah, that makes sense. And there's some things that really tax uh, that particular capacity, and I want to call them to your attention. One of them was the difference between the inclusive or and the exclusive or. If you're trying to translate or into English, as we uh, mentioned last time, well, you'll, there's lots of context when it won't come out like this vel. It won't come out inclusive. A lot of situations when or is used exclusively, quite naturally in English, we're going to adopt just one of those usages just so that we keep things clear. So we're always going to use vel, v, wedge, whatever you want to call it, we're always going to use that as an inclusive disjunction. And similarly with material impl implication, you can get into all kinds of trouble trying to make sense of the way if then is used in English, there's all kinds of usages that are different than the one we're focusing our attention on. We're going to simply use it, as mentioned, to indicate basically that it's impossible for the antecedent to be true and the conclusion false. Every other combination of truth values in a conditional we're going to accept, we'll allow, allow the horseshoe to be true for every situation except where the antecedent is true while at the same time the consequent is false. That's the one situation where, we'll, where, we'll, where we will say that horseshoe is false, that, that sentence is false. The one I want to talk about this time uh, comes up, uh, at, actually at some length, I think in one of the little, little movie features in the Logic Cafe, one of the little flash things or one of those things, where um, maybe you've come across it, maybe you haven't, but Halpin makes the point that uh, um, counterfactual conditionals are not truth functional. Have you come across that? Okay. Now that's a mouthful, um, and I guess. I guess we're going to go to the, the second part first. What is it to say something is or is not truth functional? It's, 
just, if I said that, as I am saying now, I'm repeating and I'm going to endorse what Halpin says about counterfactual conditionals, say they're not truth functional, what do I mean? They, don't have a truth table. they wouldn't have a truth table. You can't construct a truth table for them. So that's the first way of thinking about it. And we'll have another way to think about it in a second. But what, though, are counterfactual conditionals? Think about the words, counterfactual. How about contrary to fact conditionals? Yeah? Uh, we, I'm, I'm warning you, it's not truth functional, and I don't, I, I'm worried that you're trying to work it into the, the horseshoe. It's not represented by the horseshoe. Another way of saying that it's not, counter, it's not uh, truth functional is to say counterfactual conditionals cannot be represented by the horseshoe, and you'll confuse yourself, and it really is easy to do if you think they can. We're trying to make sense of the whole sentence now. Counterfactual conditionals are not truth functional. We know what truth functional is. They have no truth table. Um, what, I what is a contrary to fact conditional? Uh, it were the case. If something were the case, then something else would follow. Now, what's peculiar about this is as you'll see, I'm going to give you two examples that we're going to go through. The first one I don't think is going to make the point very clearly, the first example I use. Then we'll get to one that I think where it really will come home. But let me put it this way. Um, a counterfactual conditional is a sentence that indi indicates what would be the case if its antecedent were true. And uh, I, I mentioned that I'd have another way of, of saying what it means to say they're not, not truth functional than simply that it, you can't make a truth table out of it, and that's this fan, uh, fancy way. Counterfactual conditionals are not truth functional because their truth or falsity is not solely a function of the truth values of the component atomic sentences. That there's something else we know that's at stake when we can affirm a counterfactual conditional, something that relates the antecedent with the consequent. So it's not solely a matter of the, the, uh, the truth values of the atomic sentences. That's not where we understand, how we understand the truth of the, of the whole sentence. All right. All right, I'm going to offer you an example here. This is example number one. If McCain wins, I'm not, this is not, not a counterfactual conditional, the If McCain wins the 2008 election, Democrats are disappointed. Now, we can make a pretty obvious truth table out of that. Let's use M for McCain wins the election, and D is Democrats are disappointed. <coughs> M, actually, D. How am I going to do this column over here underneath M? Someone. How about the next one? Then I just repeat those over here. So this is the familiar material implication, which is true, false, true, true, right? So that's that's fine, all right. Then this is not a. Um, this is not a counterfactual conditional because it's not expressed in any way that you know, implicates 
things that are contrary to fact. It just mentions sentences, and we can look at all their different truth values. Here's the slightly different version. This isn't going to just jump out at you, but here's the slightly different version that really is a counterfactual conditional. And it doesn't always have to be were. Were to win would have been fine. But if he had won, that's contrary to fact, right? He didn't do it. If he had won, then Democrats would have been disappointed. That is a genuine counterfactual conditional. And you might say, wait, what's the difference? Is that, am I right that that is a problem to, to see exactly why? I mean, there's a difference in words, of course. But what the hell is the difference in the meaning? What's the difference in the logic of the sentence? Well, I claim that when you have a sentence of this form, there's something else going on. We know something, in this case, about the psychology of Democrats. We know all about what Democrats are. We know what they did. They were working very, very hard against John McCain. So we know all this background information that helps us say, say oh, yeah, they would have been. And you could imagine other scenarios where the Republican might not have been so impalatable to, to Democrats. Sometimes you know, people cross the aisle and vote for the opposite candidate. We, knew, we know all that stuff, and that's what goes into our understanding of the truth of this counterfactual tradition, uh, conditional. It doesn't depend just on you know, the T's and the F's and how they fall out between antecedents and consequences. Now, you might think, well, Maybe we should just you know, convert all these counterfactual uh, conditionals into material conditionals so that we don't have this problem. But we need those things remarkably badly. I mean, they're really are extraordinarily important sentences. And their logical treatment is, is, is very difficult. It's a very controversial matter how you're supposed to treat the logic of counterfactual conditionals. But uh, you'll see in a minute that they're, they're really quite crucial. Um, Let me offer you a different example that I think would uh, it'll help. See what the big difference is. <laughs> if Al Qaeda, did I spell that right? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. This is an indicative mood. OK? And then consider that side by side with Now, I think the difference between these two should just jump out at you. It's, it's quite glaring. In fact, the first one seems like it would have to be true, because the damn thing fell down, right? So some, something, or something else, I might have put it something else did, but uh, someone flew airplanes into it. And if it wasn't Al-Qaeda that was responsible, then someone was responsible for that. And it seems like that's true, right? But look at the second one. That's not even, I, don't, I would say that's probably not true. And it says something entirely different. That's why we've got to keep these things separate. So that's the first thing. Because they're the, the meanings that are reflected, and when we use these things, and, and you could probably use 
the words fairly artfully so that it doesn't always depend on whether there's a, an obvious were in the sentence or a would have been in the sentence. It might not always hang on that, but if you get the meaning of the sentence, what's really being said by the speaker or by the, by the, the author, you can sometimes pick out that some, it may happen that what really is working as a counterfactual conditional might be phrased in this in indicative sounding way and vice versa. That's why, it's, that's why it's a little tough sometimes to just sort of go by quick rules of thumb. Well, if I see the word is and uh, all, in, all indicative words, then ne necessarily it's, uh, it's, it's functioning as a, uh, as a material conditional. In other cases, uh, I'll, I'll, I can count on seeing ha would have been, were, uh, m uh, those things. Those aren't. It's not, it's not, it's, the reason it's not truth functional is, is now, strictly, because in a counterfactual conditional, the, the, va the truth of the sentence isn't dependent solely on the values of the truth of the components. And so you can't make a truth table out of it. Um, I mean, you can't even start. Uh, and it's probably best to, you, to view these things not as you know, so compound sentences, but as single sentences that are, have to be treated in their own right. So let's try and break that one down. Let's say, uh, if Al-Qaeda uh, AQ uh, hadn't destroyed the WATC, then uh, someone else would have. I mean, how are you going to, what is this sentence anyway? It's not Al Qaeda didn't, it, if Al Qaeda hadn't. That's not a sentence. Um, this, this part. Also, depend, you know, someone else, you know, that is not Al Qaeda, can't stand on its own either. We're saying it's someone that's not Al Qaeda would have, but it's hard to see how even to begin to symbolize these things as independent sentences, and it's probably best just to treat the whole thing, if A Q, if not A Q, uh, different. Um, Let's use the just the greater than sign for you know would have than someone else. I mean, it had to be a different connective, and we you know, I don't know how you that, that's the controversy. How would you treat that thing? Can you treat that as as two component sentences making up a third, uh, or is it better to just treat that as one single component sentence? Now I said that you need these things very badly, and I mean, what do you need them for? Um, We need them for science. And I'm going to put this on the board. We've got, I want to make a distinction between accidental generalizations, which are mere summaries of past experience, and law-like generalizations that they're supposed to identify underlying laws or regularities which go beyond the, go beyond the evidence. I mean, so that when you say that uh, E equals MC squared, well, we've had a bunch of evidence of that, right? But that's supposed to tell us what goes on in the center of the sun. We haven't been there. That's supposed to tell us what goes on in the centers of stars all over the galaxy. We haven't been in those places. We haven't experienced them. We're saying it's not, and we're also saying, look, if you were to put together, I mean, these, these law-like generalizations that we need in science are such that, you know, you, you, uh, if you were to put together fictitious circumstances, you know, different kinds of situations, you would know what would go on in those situations because you know about the law-like regularities. That's a lot different from making an observation, a mere indicative observation such as, I think an example I've used before is all the, all the marbles in this basket are or in, this, in this bottle are black. Let's say I've got a bottle of marbles and I take them out one by one and I check the color and they all turn out that they're all black. So I write down my results. All the marbles in this basket are black. That doesn't suggest that if there were another marble in, in there, then it would be black too. It's just a summary of what I got. And if there were another marble, who knows? It might be red, blue, green, black, anything. 
So that's just an accidental generalization. It merely summarizes the experiences I've had so far, whereas what we need in science, what we need in engineering, I think I brought this up before, what we need are law-like generalizations that go beyond the evidence, and they sort of, they express a connection, a natural law-like connection uh, in the world that we've, we think we've identified. We may be wrong, but we think we've identified the fact that E equals MC squared, for the most part, with, you know, to, to a high degree of accuracy. So it's there that we need counterfactual conditions. If we were to put together a spaceship in such and such a way, we were to use these so-and-so propulsion, uh, propulsion systems, we can count on the fact that it will uh, do what we want it to do, orbit the moon or go to, the, go to Mars or whatever. You put together a lot of those law-like generalizations and you can uh, build things that are brand new, that have never been built before and that do new things because you know what to expect. But that's part of what I mean by saying they go beyond the evidence. They, they reach out into new settings that we've never been in before. They reflect regularities in nature and not just mere logic. They're not, the truth of them is not dependent just on truth values of their conditional, of their, of their components. All right, any questions about that? Okay. All right. Uh, let me, if you care, here are some references to three three sources that you know talk about some of these things. And you know, Wikipedia, of course, has a little page about counterfactual conditionals. But this is a very good 2003 book by Jonathan Bennett. And um, another good book by Judea Pearl concerning these things. All right. Now, what I want to do, you're going to be doing lots and lots and lots and lots of t truth tables this week uh, before we move on to something else next. So what I want to do is to just get started with a couple of the simpler ones. I don't think that this is going to challenge you too much, uh, at least um, not these particular examples that I'm bringing up. But what I'd like you to do, you've got this on your screen, uh, proceed from the beginning. I mean, I'm, I'm not, again, some of you will be more at sea about this than others, but go ahead and construct the truth table for this particular proposition. The whole thing is written out most clearly at, way at the top, A ampersand B wedge C, and then is broken down into the table. Just go ahead and do that, and as you uh, complete the truth table, uh, please report, uh, report your status to me. Well, how, what's the way to start this thing? Simple, let's start with the simplest thing from the ground up. How do we start constructing a truth table? Like yeah, but what do I, all right, so what should I do for A? Three, 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 four, four. That's probably the wisest way. You can do this in a lot of different ways, but it's easy to keep up uh, T, T, just make half of them T's and the other half F's. And then for the rest of the variables, you just break that down a little further. T, T, F, F, T, T, F, F, T, F, T, F. Those of you who see shortcuts to do, go ahead and do them in your, on your own. I mean, you don't have to do it this way. Other people have learned other things in other contexts. But when you're working with the Logic Cafe, at least do what is required there to get, get, get you by the problems and get you um, 
approved. And then what do I do next? I bring the truth values over to the um, Now, if you're like me, you would never, you probably would never have written those three columns to the left in the first place, if you're just doing this on your own and on a piece of paper. If I've got the formula before me, I can just do this right in the formula. I don't really need to have a separate column for A, B, and C, nor do I have to have, as sometimes people, other conventions do it, I don't have to make a separate one for B or C, and a separate one for A, and then a separate one for AND. You could just take the formula. I mean, just look at it. You could just start off with, you know, eliminate the left side. This is just for your own purposes, not necessarily for the Logic Cafe, because he usually is going to start, start you with that in the first place. You know, he's going to give you the option of just poking a little button and filling in at least these, this part of the truth, truth table and the atomic values, or the values of the atomic sentences. But you could just eliminate the left three columns and just start by putting the T's and F's down A, B, and C. Just make sure you do that consistently all the way through the formula. Okay, then, the, then comes the part that isn't just mechanical. It's, a matter of, it's using the, uh, the truth table values for these formulae. And where should we start? Yeah, with the OR. And why should we start with the OR? Pardon me? It's the innermost one. I mean, you can start there, in more complicated formulas. You can always find several that have that function. Knots, you know, the little uh, tildes are almost always like that, unless they're on the outside of a formula. But if you see a not A or a not V, you can do those first. It's the smallest, most internal value ones, and then you work out <coughs> toward the periphery. So uh, vel is true anytime either one of these things is true. So I'm just going to go right down that. True, true, true. That's false, because both are false. True, 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 and false. Correct? And now the, well, there's only one left, and that's the main connective. Okay, the last one you do is the main connective. It's the one that really is sort of doing the main work of the sentence. Of course, this sentence could have been broken down differently, but that's not, that would make a different sentence. Um, so now, ampersand is true when both of the conjuncts are true. Now, in this case, I'm trying to hook up this, I'll put these at the top, with this. Those are the ones that I, I need to look at to find out whether ampersand is true. So it's true, 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 false in all the rest of the cases. All right? Now, look at this thing and tell me, you know, because that's part of the, some of the exercises that you're going to be doing in, during week three, is uh, what, remind, someone else remind us of what the defini uh, definition of a logical truth is. I think it's from week one. What is a logical truth? It's a, yeah, it, or it's impo I think the way we put it before was it's impossible for the sentence to be false. That's a logical truth. Not possible. We now have a new way with a truth table of, of, of showing what that means. We've got all the possible combinations of truth value between the, the atomic sentences A, B, and C. All of them are listed on this, on this uh, truth table. And we can see that in some rows, on some of, in some of those combinations of truth values, there are T's, and in some rows, there are F's in the main connective. So sometimes the sentence can be true, and sometimes the sentence can be false. What does that tell you about the sentence? Well, it's neither a logical truth nor a logical falsity, so what is it? It's logically indeterminate. Okay. Another one.
Okay, uh, where shall I start? Okay. Pardon me? The BRO, all right, fine. We could have started with the curl on, on, the, on the Z too. That would be just as small. That would work because it's not controlling anything else. But we just want to make sure we start with something that isn't you know, controlling another connective because we can't know what it does. We can't know, um, you know what, the, what, what an outside connector does until we know what the inside connector does. So, so we'll just fill in the OR. T, 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 T. And now what? And now you need to do the not. You can't do the and yet. So this is simple enough. It's F. Now we can do the and. We're looking for these two. This is the main connective right there. So it's false, false, false. True, 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 false. Does that look right? And once again, this is uh, neither logically true nor logically false because it has possible false interpretations if you you know in, in, on certain lines um, it's true in certain lines it's false so it's logically indeterminate once again does anybody have any trouble with these things okay they're pretty straightforward let us then <coughs> settle for doing one more Okay, what should I start with? Okay. <coughs> and then the ampersand, right? And so those are the two I want to join up. That's the main connective. So it's false, true, false, false, false. So that's nearly what? It's not quite, though. It's nearly a logical falsehood. To be a logical falsehood, it would have Fs on every line of its truth table in the main connective. To be a logical truth, it would have Ts in every line of its truth table. This one has all lines F except for one, so it falls short of being a logical falsehood. It's, once again, logically indeterminate. All it takes is one line. Um, Sam. Can I go over a necessary condition and a satisfactory condition? Or yeah, sufficient. Sure. Um, new page. All right. What's the necessary condition that's mentioned here? I, I put this sentence in a kind of a, in a normal English way, but one that might make the logic make you think a second or two. What is a necessary condition of what, S Sam? Um, the, the that's it. Okay, right. So it's uh, okay. Being. Employed, I'll just say that, is a necessary condition of being here. So 
E then E is a, is a necessary condition of being here. Gesundheit, 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 Max. <laughs> All right. How would we symbolize that? B horseshoe E, right? And what now? What's the logic behind that? Well, if I'm here, since I, I mean, what the sentence says is, if I'm here, you know, I'm employed. I mean, whether it's true or not is another matter. But what the sentence says, and that's what we're trying to do, is impact. You know, we're un unpack the meaning of the sentence. The sentence says, if I'm here, that's B. My being here means that I'm employed by RIT. I mean, you can count on it. So it's saying that this, what's impossible is that I could be here, that that could be true, while this is false. That's what's impossible. That's what that sentence rules out. And that's, that's all our material condition means. So that to, whenever you see something is the necessary condition for something else, the necessary condition is going to go in the consequent space, on the right side of the horseshoe. Whereas sufficient conditions, that means it's enough. So if I'm here, that's, that's, that'll, that's enough to let you know that I'm employed by RIT. That's what the sentence is saying. That's why the word sufficient is used there. So sufficient conditions go on the left. I guess you could schematize it that way by saying sufficient implies necessary. Now, did you want, did you need more said about that, Sam? No, I think that works. What about sufficient and necessary? Aha! Uh -huh. what, 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 well, that means if something, if A is a sufficient condition for B and A is also a necessary condition for B, then what could you write down? You could say, well, the first one is what? How would I write that in our logic notation? Sam. No, not just the first one. Using this, yeah. And, and what's this one? B implies A. Okay. So if, something, if, if that holds, if A is a sufficient condition for B and the necessary condition for B, then we know that A horseshoe B and B horseshoe A, and as I mentioned, although we haven't dwelled on this yet, we will in the course of time, uh, that's the same. To say that both of those are true is to say A triple bar B. So to say that something is a necessary and sufficient condition for something else is to say both of those two things or simply to say that, that A if A then B, and if B then A. And if you went through and did the, 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 um, the truth tables, come on, move. A horseshoe B ampersand. Whoop. you'd find out that they're the same. That this line, that this and this would be the same. This is the easy one.
So you see they're logically equivalent. And you can always check that out. If, you're, if you want to see, if you're comparing one logical connective to another, you can always com, you know, compare. And then we'll find all kinds of interesting equivalences among various formulations, various combinations of our connectives that will serve as shortcuts also uh, and, uh, when we're doing derivations. We don't have to you know, do quite uh, pr proofs that are quite as long just because we'll be able to avail ourselves of certain standard uh, shortcuts. All the sentences of SL that we've been dealing with are, are really, I mean, they're, think of them as the letters. I and mean, what, what, what we're manipulating is the letters. We keep using examples like, uh, uh, you know, wacky things, you know, Agnes will go to law school or whatever. Uh, but the really important things are the abstract formula. You know, think of it as A wedge B or curl A horseshoe B or any one of the examples that we've used before. It's these things, uh, these formulae that uh, we manipulate in SL and that they may or may not have meanings isn't important to us except uh, with, with one exception that I'm going to get to right now and that we got to a little bit already. Um, but the, the point here is that in order to uh, to use this, this formalism, this, this, uh, this symbolic setup, uh, we would next have to interpret, interpret um, the sentences in, in some, some language or another as meaning something or other, maybe in mathematics, maybe in English, maybe in French, who knows? I mean, this is supposed to be a universal <laughs> abstract language, and it works this way. That it doesn't matter whether you've learned it in French or German or Chinese or Japanese or whatever, you could still, you know, work with this symbolic uh, language, you know, across all of those other linguistic boundaries. So it's a language on its own, but it's a perfectly abstract and formal one. Now, one interpretation that we might do, I mean, we might have something like A wedge B. This is the way that the, the problems have been set up in the Logic Cafe, or curl A horseshoe B. I mean, we might just say, all right, let's let A equals, um, I don't know, Arnold. Anybody named Arnold in here? I hope not. Arnold? No, I don't think so. Because this, these whack, these examples just, I don't know what is wrong with my brain, but um, the, okay, all right. Arnold is a dimwit, Betty has no neck. I mean, you can interpret the sentences to mean anything you'd like, but uh, it, it really doesn't matter. We can do it that way. That's the way that he'll continue to, the, to do this in the Logic Cafe exercises. But another interpretation that, uh, that, that we've encountered, and this is an interpretation just as well, is just interpret the letters in terms of their truth values, like T or F. And indeed, if you were going to do this uh, really abstractly, if you really sort of go the full nine yards, the full 10 yards, the full 100 yards. If you go the whole, the whole distance, uh, you wouldn't even maybe use the words truth and falsity. It sounds like you're already trying to attach this to some sort of intuitive meaning. Like, you know, we know what, think what it is for, we sort of have an, a general idea, actually. I don't know if we know, but we have a general idea of what, we're, what distinction we're trying to make when we distinguish between truth and falsity. But that's another thing. It has to do with our intuitions. And we're trying to avoid uh, mere intuitions. We're trying to set up a formal language that allows us to sort of trust it because it's a mechanical procedure and it doesn't n n necessitate our interpreting anything at all. So you could do this, you know, you could just separate sentences into two classes, uh, class one and class two. And you could, s and then you start talking about, all right, well, um, let me see if I can do that. Just to give me an example, because it's you know it's, it's modestly interesting. We could just say that, for example, uh, we remember we had the truth table for a wedge b. Okay, so that we can say we're going to sort sentences into two classes: class one and class two. And for the wedge, we're going to so we'll just say class one, class two. And we're not even interpreting these classes. They're just two different kind of categories of things. 
And we say that the, we interpret the wedge as being in class two only when both of the disjuncts are. And we don't even have to, you know, we don't even have to associate it with the word or or disjunction or anything in the English language. You could just talk about the abstract relationship of A and B. We're going to sort them in two classes. And the rule, I'm just going to give a rule that says uh, we're going to put sentences that go A wedge B into class two only in the case that uh, both of the uh, both of the both of the elements we'll call them both the elements of the sentence A and B are also in class two. And we can say a ampersand B goes into class two all the time unless both of the elements of the sentence happen to be in class one. So we could talk that way. And we're sort of avoiding all sorts of interpretations. But our truth tables, and, and we can run our, all of our truth tables in this way. But uh, it's, it sort of helps to keep this grounded a little bit if we use some, you know, we sort of appeal to intuition in some way, shape, or form. And so we're going to keep going with T's and F's while not necessarily caring about uh, Arnold or Beverly or Agnes or Bob or any of the other people or, and what they're doing with their lives. I mean, this is not the important topic of logic. It's the relationship of the elements and the sentences. Um, so we're going to talk about truth values. And the way we're going to define that is we're going to say the truth value assignment is nothing more than the association of a single letter, T or F, or a single truth value with every atomic sentence of our language our sentence logic, SL. That's what we mean by a truth value assignment. So that's the definition up there. Now, as we've seen already, um, when we talked about how the connectives are, you know, like I just did with ones and twos, but we went through the whole litany of the different ways that the connectives are influenced by the truth values of the atomic sentences that make them up. Um, we, we know that we can determine the truth value of any molecular sentence using the connectives that we've been given uh, by our little rules. Um, and an, you know, an, the, the example that we've used is that we, when we have we want to have a sentence like a wedge curl b. Um, <coughs> If we, if we just give one single assignment, and this is what, you know, when we have a, a one line truth value, we're just sort of declaring, let's just say A is true and B is false. So then we just work it out this way. And we get that truth, truth table. But of course, this is just one possibility. And then we expand on our truth tables by considering, let's use the same example. all the possibles. Think about right. sometimes. OK. All right. So we've got all the different possibilities that, uh, that these two atomic sentences could possibly take on. They, that tells us uh, what the different possibilities are for A wedge curl B for the molecular sentence. And uh, in general, truth tables allow us to calculate every possible uh, truth value for the most complicated sentences that you can assemble with this apparatus, every possible truth value that it could have. And then it's interesting to inspect the lot of them, the, the entire collection, to see if there's any patterns. And that's what we talk about when we refer to logical equivalence uh, 
uh, the, the two sentences, for example, do they all have the, the, the sentence? The sentences on every line always have the same value given the same assignment of, of uh, truth values to the atomic sentences. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, logically true, logically false, and logically indeterminate sentences. Those are properties of the entire truth table of, of a sentence, a molecular sentence. So, um, well, so that yields this, where we get more than two atomic sentences in the mix. Like if we had some sentence like A and B and C. And these are the things that we've reviewed already. Now we have a longer truth table. And this is the main connective, and that tells us about the sentence as a whole. <coughs> now, you know, let me just ask you in brief, this, this is a truth table with uh, having three sentence variables, A, B, and C. Um, how many variables would we have? I mean, how many lines would we have in a truth table with four variables? 16. Um, as a general rule, we can always calculate by truth tables all those possible truth values of that molecular sentence, and the number of rows that we'll get is governed by this for formula. In general, the number of atomic where the number of atomic components is n, the number of rows is two to the n. Now that covers ground that we've covered before. What I wanted to do is to go on and talk about the relationships between the two sentences. We've already discussed the questions of you know, logically true, logically false, and logically indeterminate sentences. Uh, what I want to do is to talk about these other categories, a valid argument, an invalid argument, logically equivalent sentences, and logically inconsistent sentences. Uh, these are other ideas that were raised in the very first week. But we talked about them in terms of what's possible and what's not possible. And that's an intuitive notion. And uh, as here as elsewhere, we'd like to get away from intuitive notions and be able to point to something mechanical, something that is uh, in our logical apparatus that will allow us to interpret these ideas. We know how to do those three. Now we're going to go on to interpret uh, the, these next two categories, or valid, validity, invalidity, logically equivalent, and logically inconsistent uh, sentences. Uh, now, we also covered ground uh, in the first week. We talked about sound arguments. Uh, why don't we have mechanical procedures up here for deciding on whether an argument is sound or not? Because it depends on assigning truth values to the assumptions of the argument, which you can't do with sentence logic. You can't. Logic doesn't allow us to determine whether sentences are true or not, unless they are logically true. I mean, that's the one case where a sentence is true just by virtue of its linguistic uh, format, its linguistic shape, its linguistic pattern, uh, those sentences are logically true. And we know which ones those are. They're the ones that, uh, that have the letter T on every line of the truth table for the main connected. And we can talk about logically false sentences. They're true by virtues of the meanings of the <coughs> terms. They're true by virtues of the structures of the sentences. They're true not because we have to look out in the world to see if they're true. They're true because of the definitions of the terms or because of some other thing like that. I mean, you can look at a, a, you know, a, a tautology 
is another word for this. A tautology is a sentence, uh, maybe in English, that's true, you know, whether, you know, no matter what. Like, for example, uh, the sentence, a bachelor is unmarried, or bachelors are unmarried. You don't have to go out in the world and take a survey to find out that that's true. If you know the meaning of the word bachelor, you know that bachelors are unmarried. So you just sort of, you know, it's, 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 it's like this it's business of unpacking the meanings of terms, unpacking what's already been told to you. If you know you got a bachelor, you know it's unmarried. I don't have to, I don't have to talk about um, circles being round. I mean, I, to say that a circle, you know, to talk about a square circle is a con we call it a contradiction in terms. Because the very idea of square or squareness, you know, makes it impossible for the thing to be round. Squares have four corners. Circles don't have any. The perimeter of a circle is always equidistant from the center. That's not true about a square. These are things that make it impossible for there to be such a thing as a square circle. So you don't have to go out in the world and look for one. And you don't have to go out and take a survey of all the bachelors in the world and then collect your, you know, just go around the world and send out this little form as some government agency might be inclined to do and find out, you know, just you know, send it to every, everybody in the world and say, are you a bachelor? That's question one. And question two is, okay, are you unmarried? Uh, and then you collect all that data and you throw <laughs> it through a very you know, elaborate statistical process and you find out and you come up with a great result it sounds like a, you know, a lot of the funded work that's done by big agencies, but you, know, you just sort of you find, collect all this work and you think, whoa, turns out that in, in almost all cases, bachelors are unmarried. I mean, it wouldn't be like that. If, they were, if people were understanding the question and telling the truth, everybody would check either the none or both of those boxes because it's true by virtue of the meaning of terms. You don't have to go out and look at the world to find out that that's true. So that's a situation where we can make sense of truth and falsity within logic, where it's logical truth and logical falsity. But since soundness requires that the premises be true and is not limited to cases where the premises are, um, are logically true and logically false, we're not able to determine truth or falsity in general. So we don't have special criteria in logic uh, for deciding on the soundness of sentences. For most sentences, you'd have to go out and look at the world. You have to do an examination, empirical investigation. And that's the business of science, observation, and things like that. OK. <clears throat> All right. Um, to start with, this is the way we defined logically true before. A sentence is logically true if and only if it could not possibly be false. And we now have defined it more recently. A sentence in, in SL is logically true if and only if its truth table has no line on which the main connective is false. Before we define logically false in this way, if uh, a sentence is logically false if and only if it couldn't possibly be true, now we have this more rigorous definition that says that it's false if and only if its truth table has no line on which the main connective is true. Every line has main connective F. All right, now, how, how, what, what, now what, remind me what the, the definition of logical indeterminacy is? Then, when's the sentence logically indeterminate? Nathan. When it's neither logically true nor logically false. And that means what? How will it look like? And then determine the truth value without, with just sentence logic. OK, but I, let's, let's do this in terms of truth tables. I mean, that's what the more rigorous <coughs> definition of this one is if its truth table has no line in which the main connection is true, what will the truth table of a logically indeterminate sentence look like? There will be true and false. There will be t's and f's on different lines, at least one t and at least one f. So in other words, not all T's and not all F's, but that's exactly what you were trying to say before. But this is, I'm trying to get this in, you know, uh, 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 interpreted in terms of truth tables. So that's the definition of uh, the logically indeterminate sentence. Validity. An argument is valid just in case 
It's not possible for the conclusion, not possible again, that was the vague intuitive idea we were using before. I, you remember, it was in, I, I, I gave you the best I could do. I gave you those Venn diagrams to talk about uh, how, how um, you know, this is what we mean, I said, when I said that the, the, the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true. In other words, that when you write the, the Venn diagrams for the premises, the conclusion's already there. You don't have to write anymore. You don't have to do anything like make an inference to something else because it's, the information is already in the premises. You're just unpacking that information when, when you derive the conclusion. Think about this. All I really did was to draw a bunch of circles on the board and point and then talk as persuasively as I could. I was appealing to intuitions rather than something that was really rigorous. I mean, you might think that those visual diagrams were rigorous, and maybe they are in a sense. Maybe they are in a kind of a geometric sense. But it, it's just as it's true in geometry that once, once we had algebraic ways of interpreting geometry, after Rene Descartes, who invented uh, the Cartesian coordinate system and invented analytic <coughs> geometry, once we had a way of expressing geometric truths in algebraic form, it was easy to sort of feel, feel like you were more convinced of arguments because the, the rigor, their rigor was at least more transparent. I mean, um, the, the, the old form of proofs in geometry looked very much like this logic stuff we're doing, but, it was, it, it, but always using illustrations, always using pencils and compasses and things like that. And uh, the, the intuition had always been there ever since Plato, like 2,000 some years ago. The intuition has always been there that these diagrams are just, you know, they're just illustrations. The truths are, are somehow more fundamental than these diagrams we're drawing. And the algebraic interpretation, once we were able to do that, helped to, helped to reveal uh, the, the, uh, the more rigorous character of, of even geometric proofs. So here, too, uh, we're going to try and, and, and do something a little bit better. And we're going to say that an argument is valid in, 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 in the sentence log logic just in case there's no truth value assignment on which the conclusion is false while the premises are all true. So in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to do truth tables of the premises, each one, each one of the sentences in the premises. And we're going to do a truth table for the conclusion. And we're going to look at all of the different uh, truth value possibilities and we're going to declare the argument valid just in case there is no truth value assignment at all, no line on the argument's truth table where the conclusion is false while the premises are all true. If there's even just one line, even one possibility for the premises to be true and the conclusion is false, then the argument is not valid. And then of course an argument is invalid in every other case. If, you know, if, the, if there's as I say, even one line where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, then, uh, then that argument is invalid. So um, this will allow us a, a way of demonstrating, not just sort of intuiting or not just visualizing uh, that an argument is valid. With complicated arguments, it could be a very elaborate procedure, and we're going to try and do something better later in the course. But for now, we're, we've moved from a, a fairly, something that is really just an intuitive understanding of, uh, of validity to something that's a good deal more rigorous. Let's do an example of that. Let's take the argument. A horseshoe B, <coughs> A, therefore B. <coughs> if you know that if A then B, and if you know A, then you're entitled to draw out B. So the question is, is this argument valid? We've got two variables, so A, B. Now I'm going to put for here, I'm going to put two lines just to, 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 to separate the sentences, the premises. A horseshoe B, and then B, or I'm sorry, A. Then A, therefore. 
therefore be. So as before, we drew false, false. Here, help me fill in the this this row here, line one. Just yell it out. Line one, under the horseshoe. True. 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 Line two. False. 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 Because you've got a true antecedent, a false consequence, so therefore line two is false, and true and true. Now. The question is, is there any line on, uh, in this argument where both of the uh, premises are true and the conclusion is, wait a minute, that's not good. This is, uh -huh. false, false, that's fine. I was careless. Okay, um, so is there any line on this truth table where both of the premises are true and the conclusion false. There's none. So this argument is valid. Okay. Okay, now, Another issue is two sentences being logically equivalent. We'll be doing exercises on these also. So let's look at that. Two sentences are, of SL are logically equivalent if and if they're all of their, their, their main connective lines are all the same. If and if there's no line on their joint truth table where the main connective of one sentence is true while the main connective of the other is false. So let's say we've got, <coughs> and I won't put the A and B columns in here, I'll just say A horseshoe B, let's say that's one sentence. Let's say, I've mentioned before, that I've mentioned this equivalence before in connection with the wedge where some people had put uh, something like this, uh, some people, I'm going to erase this in a second, something that instead of L or, was it M? I forgot, but instead of L or M, some people said not L or shoe M. Turns out those two things are equivalent, I had said, and we're now going to see something very close to that in these two. So we're going to go true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. This time I'll be more careful, true, true, false, false. True. You weren't more careful. I was, because I haven't done the curl yet. Um, that's what you're looking at? Yeah. Okay. So now I'll go the curl, because I, I want to keep these things underneath the letters, right? So I just I just went moved over to the letter and repeated the A under there. So then that is false, false, true, true, right? And then this becomes uh, true, because we're, now we're comparing these two lines. True, false, true, true. So this is the main connective over there. And this becomes uh, true, false, true, true. And if you look at those two things, they're the same. And that's a, that's that's a demonstration that those two sentences are logically equivalent. Do you see how that works? Does it make sense to you? That that, that should be a definition that that makes sense as a definition of logical equivalence of sentences. All right. Okay, then the last one we're going to work with today is uh, logical consistency. What does it mean to say, well, I mean, either, either give us the old definition of logical consistency when two sentences are consistent, or if you like, venture into the truth, you know, our new, more rigorous definition. What is it? What, you know, Intuitively, or in, with truth tables, what does it mean to say that two sentences are logically consistent? Or how, what is our interpretation of that? Anybody? 
Think what it means. Yeah. There's at least one row on the truth table where both are true. That's right. They both could. And what we said before was that uh, it's logically consistent. Two sentences are logically consistent if uh, if it's possible, if it is possible for both sentences to be true together. And in our truth table interpretation, that's going to come down to this: uh, two se a set, any set. You know, we're going to use two for our example because I don't want to write 16 sentences up here. But any set of sentences is logically consistent if and only if there's at least one line on their <laughs> joint truth table where you you have to make sure you're doing this on a joint truth table where you're assigning consist. If you got A and B for example, A has got to have the same truth value throughout for all the sentences. B has got to have the same sentences uh, truth value throughout for all the sentences. But if, once you've done that, you're saying, all right, what's, let's say A is true and B is false. Is it possible in these two, for both of these two sentences to be true in that case? The way we test that is to see if there's any line on their joint truth table, which is the sort of thing we've been doing uh, with, for, that we, we'll call this a joint truth table uh, for these two sentences, trying to test for their logical equivalence. Okay, that's a joint truth table. Uh, for logical consistency, if there's any line on their joint truth table where both are true, then that shows that they are consistent. I mean, they at least can be both true together. So they're at least consistent with one another. And all you need is one line. So that, for example, if we have, uh, let's use A or B and not B. I encourage you to do it this way too. I know there's a, 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 a you know an inclination simply to just jump to saying um, you know, already doing the curl. But I, I I do encourage you uh, because of the complications that you'll encounter with more complicated formulae when you're trying to negate those. Just take it step by step. So we're just going to put the truth table for the B in here, then do this. I understand that it's easy to be impatient with that. But that's the main connective of not B. And over here, we've got T, whoops, T, 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 F. So the question then arises, is there any line on the truth table where both are true? And indeed, we do have one there. OK, so those two sentences are, con are consistent. Any questions about these things? All right, let's uh, let's try some out. All right, uh, go ahead and uh, work on this one. I tried to set it up so you can see what's going on. Notice. We're asking here if the, these two sentences are logically equivalent. And then what I've done is I put them each in brackets in my little uh, possibly clumsy looking um, uh, table. But I put the, each of those formulas in brackets and separated them by a, by a comma. So go ahead and, and do that. OK, you can read off yours if you want, uh, or just look at, up here. Let's start, with, uh, let's start with this one. This is simple because it's uh, only connective in this other, on, the, on the left side. Um, uh, somebody let me know what the truth values should be down along this line.
Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the equivalence, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at something and you can't see what I'm pointing at. The, uh, if the, the triple bar between A and G, we're going to finish up the, le the, the first sentence and then we'll go on to the second sentence. What, what, uh, what should those numbers be? Somebody is not Nathan this time. Yeah. <coughs> true, true, false, 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 true, true. Uh, I didn't hear you, but did you? I, did you, I thought you. Yeah, you, did, you, did I get the right over That's correct. All right, somebody else. Let's move way over here to this implication. Sorry, you know, this one over here? I was, uh, yeah, I was looking at Okay, true, true, false, false, and all the rest are false, right? Or true, true, and all the rest are true. Yeah. True, true. Uh, right? Okay, now let's go to the other implication. Uh, Pete? Lowry? Yes. Can you, do, you, do you have that, the, the far right implication? Yeah. True. True. Where, where are we? The far right implication, way over there, L horseshoe A, uh, we're trying to get the truth values under the horseshoe. Yeah. So what, 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 should, what, should, what should it be? You got true. the first two. True. Yeah, true, false. No, true, true. Yeah, so or the first plane would be true. <coughs> I just want you to t read uh, down the column underneath the horseshoe. Tell me, don't read it, just tell me what the truth value should be. I've already written the first two. Uh, I see, see what I'm talking about? Yeah, the third one should be true. Okay, so we're now going to start with the third one, all right? Yes, yeah, okay. okay. Good, so true. 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 False. False. True. True. False. False. True. True, good. Now finally, these are the two things we're looking for. Uh, this and this to get the under the ampersand. Sam? Oh, um, true, true, false, false. Wait, false? <coughs> yeah, there it is. I see. I'm looking at the wrong column. False, 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 false. Go ahead. False, true, false, true. Right. So that's that. And this is this. So are they equivalent? <coughs> Why? Where do you see the indications that they're not equivalent? Whoever said no. Towards the bottom of the table. I'm sorry, what? Towards the bottom of the table. Towards the bottom of the table. Which which lines of the well, let's if call you look it? Up, if you look up uh, eight, seven, six, five, four. If you look at the second from the bottom, okay. you'll see that you have a true false. Aha. And so line check. seven. Okay. Anything else? Line six. <coughs> Is it six? Five. I'm looking at the wrong thing. True, true. Line six, true line false. five. Uh -huh. Five. 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 Six. Okay, yeah, false. 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 Anything else? No. Okay. All right, so that's that's the way you do that kind of problem, okay? <coughs> and okay, and try this one out. This is, is the following argument valid? Once again, I tried. I separated the two premises, put each of the premises in brackets, separated by then by a comma, and I separated the set of premises from the conclusion by putting a slash. Can you see that over there? Let's try and keep things straight. Now let's start with asking Nathan, is the argument valid or not? Yes. It is. How do you know? Because if the definition is valid, you only care about the line in which A, B, and C are true. So okay. true, 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 true. I see. So you did that one line, 
Where, why do you, why do you only care about that line? Because the definition says that you only care. And we care about when the premises, premises are true. A, neither A nor B nor C is a premise. Still true though. <laughs> well, it is valid, but right. uh, let's let's go look at this okay. now. So true, 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 false, false. We need to look, check all the lines where the premises are all true. Now let's just begin by figuring out which lines uh, of the, uh, let's, let's work with the far left premise, A horseshoe B. Um, let's stick with Nathan. Nathan, tell me, when is that premise true? Or just, just go down the, underneath the horseshoe. Line one, line two. I'll, I'll, let's fill in the falses false. too. Okay, true, true, false, false, true. Okay, so there's seven of the eight lines in which that premise is true. Now let's check out the second premise, B, horseshoe, C. True, false, true, true, true. False, true, true. Okay, so we've got, I'm going to number these again. We've got not just one line where the premises are true, we've got line one, line four, line five, line seven, and line eight. So those lines are important if we're trying to consider when the premises are true. Over here, uh, let's do, uh, once again, go ahead. Line four. Say what? Line four. Yep. The first premise is false. Yeah, it's false. So it's T T F F T T T T. That's a, that's that's an A horseshoe B. And over here, let's double check our work uh, for B horseshoe C. It's always a good idea. T F T T T F T T. So the lines on which the premises are true. I'll put this over here. Both of them are. Line one, line five, line seven, line eight. Check that. My eyes play tricks on me when I'm trying to find these columns and, and check the right column. So there's, there are four different lines it looks like to me wherein the premises are true, right? Okay, so now, now let's go uh, to the conclusion, and I'll, I'll just fill this one in, true, false, true, false, and true, 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 true. So there are two places where the conclusion is false, line two and four, and that's all we really care about. We want to know, is there any line in which the premises are both true and the conclusion false, and I'm doing it this way, there's no line where I you know, mark the conclusion as false and the premise is true at the same time. But I think we had to look a good deal more than line one, Nathan. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and the reason is because it, the A, B, and C aren't the premises. I think that was the thing that may have you know, sort of been you know, the first thought. They are just the atomic sentences. And the premises are these more complicated things, the molecular sentences, uh, these two. All right, any questions about this one? All right, now. So what we've done is we've shown, uh, we, we 
talks about you know sentences being sentences being equivalent, set, uh, sentences being consistent with one another, and sentences uh, let me get to my, and, and arguments being valid. And uh, those are the those are the sorts of exercises you're going to see uh, through this week. And uh, um, I want to be sure that you, you sort of understand how these are to be done. Is it clear? Does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? Okay, once again, we'll open the class to either your, if you'd like to sort of work in the Logic Cafe, or if you do have any questions you'd like to address to me, uh, I'll, I'll hang around. And if you have other things that you would prefer to do and uh, would be more profitable ways to spend your time, please feel free to leave. The class is officially closed now. And uh, we'll see you next week.